Okay, we're beginning our discussion and we focus on a wide range of things, but most importantly, we're going to look at um, arrangements of objects. In this case, we're looking at the arrangements of six zeros, four ones, three twos are there. Well, how many arrangements of the six zeros, four ones, and three twos are there in which the first zero precedes the first one? Okay. Now we need to obviously just count quickly and realize what's happening here. So first things first, so we have how many positions? So we have six positions here. Right, in which case uh, you have four positions and here we have three positions. These are positions. Okay. Or if you have four plus three plus that, so we have a total of six plus four plus three, which gives us 13 positions. Within positions. Okay. And hence we start the solution as follows. Excuse. Right, we start the, 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 the solution as follows and say, what did I do? Right, I just template into that. Okay, it's fine. Right, so once again, the number of positions right equals six plus four plus three six plus four plus three which equals 13 positions they are 13 positions Thirteen positions available. There are thirteen positions available. Right. Okay. Thirteen positions available. Right. Altogether for the arrangement. There are 13 positions available for the arrangement. Right, so we are looking at the arrangement such that in which the first zero precedes the first one. So the first zero um, precedes the first one. Okay, as said. Right, so we decide to choose you decide to choose a place We have three twos. In how many ways would you would you place the three twos? Um, so you would place them in out of thirteen positions, you will choose three positions to place the objects. What is happening here? Right. Out of the 13 positions altogether, let's just say that to simplify matters, the same thing, you can draw diagrams and things, but right. Um, out of the 13 positions, you choose three positions in which you place the three twos. Um, the reason it's it's easy to place the twos because there are further conditions on the zero and the one. So we do not have restrictions quite on the twos. So they are, we have much freedom. 
So we can easily place the twos. Okay. Because it's easy to place the twos, what do you do? So we're going to choose three positions and place the twos um, amongst the 13 positions. So we, we shall therefore say um, 13 positions choose three ways. Okay, you can simplify that, but yeah. Normally, you simplify the end. Just use the same approach as, as recommended. So we shall do that. We shall place the twos in 13 choose three ways. Okay. Now we come to the condition where now they are, are suggesting how we need to place the zero and the first one. Right. So with those conditions, um, we then put those into focus. Right, so we shall then say now, right, put the zero because the, the first zero precedes the first one. So now, put, put zero in the first. of the remaining positions. Of the remaining positions. Right, now put zero in the first, because zero, which the first zero precedes the first one. So we'll have after I play have to play the two the remaining positions, but now you must put zero first in the remaining positions because it must come first before the first one. So because you put zero in the in the first of the remaining positions, there's one way. One way for this. Okay. How many positions are left? Because we have chosen three positions. And now you have a position to put the zero. Four. You continue. Now, then pick five other positions. Five other positions for the remaining zeros, because there are six zeros. You have just placed one zero, and then we have five zeros left. So then pick five. Five other positions for the remaining zeros. For the remaining zeros. Which can be done in how many ways? In how many ways can this be done? So obviously out of the 13, you subtract four positions that have been filled. So we're left with nine positions. And these can be done in nine, choose five ways. Nine, choose five ways. What is then the total number of ways? Because now, We have so what is then the total number of ways to do this? What is then the total number of ways to do this? 
So, the total number of ways So you have a sequence of processes to, to perform. So first we placed the three twos because they were easy to place without any uh, 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 restrictions or conditions on the twos. So we chose three positions um, out of the 13 positions. Then the next positions were uh, putting the zero first because now we must say we're told that meter zero precedes the first one. Right, so, but if we decide to put a zero first, we did that in one way. And then now we can put the other zeros in the remaining positions in nine to five ways. After having put the zero first, then would have satisfied the condition required. Okay, 13 choose three would be 13 factorial. 13 minus three, yeah. 13 minus three. Okay, just remember the combinatorial symbol. Um, N choose R is N factorial. N minus R factorial, R factorial. 13 minus three. Three factorial. And then nine factorial. Nine minus five factorial. Five factorial. Okay. So we have satisfied the main conditions of putting the zero first. And that was done in one way and we were able to arrange the rest of the zeros amongst the remaining positions. And therefore the remaining um, calculations can easily be done in, in, that, in, that, in this manner. Um, all right, obviously one can use a calculator to do this one, but um, one can also um, just simplify these. Normally, because the numbers are very large, we, uh, students are not encouraged to simplify these. So that is going to be 10 factorial, 3 factorial. That's going to be 9 factorial, um, 4 factorial. That's going to be 5 factorial. And that's going to be 13. So 13 factorial. You can reduce 13 factorial to 10 and cancel that. 9 factorial, you can reduce it to the to five factorial, and then cancel out. And then obviously use the calculator to simplify the um, rest of this. So you can use a calculator to just uh, do it from the um, multiplication at the beginning. So, right, so another student can come and say 13 factorial is 13, 13 minus one is 12, minus one is 11. And then you have 10 factorial, you divide by 10 factorial, 3 factorial. So the 10 factorial is going to cancel. 9 factorial can be reduced to 9 minus 1 is 8, minus 1, 7, minus 1, 6, and then 5 factorial. And then you have 4 factorial, 5 factorial. So you cancel this here. The, the, the 3 factorial is 6. So 6 because I'm in time. 6 divides the 12, giving us 2, 11. Okay, five factorial cancels out. And then four factorial is the same as 24. Can you put 24 there? Nine by... Hey, can you look at how 24 further divides the whole thing? Yeah, okay. Because eight by six is 48. You divide 48 by 24. Is only two by seven, and then you just do your um, calculator work, and then the answer will have to be this one here. 
So um, we have managed to organize these. So we have arranged this or the number of ways is these ways. Okay, so to arrange this is just a question of the positions. It's a question of positions, there are 13 positions, etc. So it's a question of positions than anything else. Right, so next question. Right, full field. All right, so obviously the repeat repetitions here. Um, how many arrangements of the letters in fulfilled have all the following properties simultaneously? Okay, so we are uh, looking at the properties. Okay, this is very popular in this module. Now, no consecutive uh, consecutive Fs. The vowels E, R, and U are in alphabetical order. The three letters, the three Ls are next to each other. That is, they can be grouped like this. Okay. Let's look at these. So we're asking how many arrangements of the letters in fulfilled have all the following properties. Right, so the easiest way is to say, is to always say those letters that are grouped together. Grouped, uh, uh, grouped together, so those ones become the easiest. So now you deal with them as one object. Like in this case, the three L's, uh, they are um, uh, actually uh, put together. For now, right, so the first thing is that print. It's L, L, L. There's a single letter. Okay, it's easier. So how many letters are I left with? Right, so if you treat those ones as one letter, so you have F, U, so I'm gonna look at the list, and then L, 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 okay, there's another F, you have I here, you have E and D. Okay. You have just at least, you can put and D there, but yeah, you have that. Okay. What is the next thing we need to do here? Right. Right. But now we have no consecutive Fs. So how many Fs are there altogether? There are two of them. So no consecutive Fs, this one. So we consider that no consecutive Fs. Right, no consecutive Fs would mean we have some letters and then F and then here you put none F and then because there are only two and then you can put other letters there, but they can't be consecutive. So you have this arrangement. Okay. It's uh, just a rough idea. Okay. Right, there is a, a property of distributions. Right, so we learn the distributions when it comes to these concepts here. Right, so we shall speak about distributions now. 
Right, how do we perform these distributions? Right, let's discuss the, the property of performing a series of distributions. Right, a series of the distributions. Right, so these distributions can be done in a couple of ways. We have learned yesterday a property that allows us to perform distributions, but there are more formulas that um, we need to understand for us to be in a position to perform a series of distributions. Right, okay, so we're gonna discuss that in a minute. I want to give one formula that we use to understand distributions very well. Um, right, 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 right. There is a formula I want to give that is going to help us to understand distributions very, very well. Right, so we learned the formula of the combinations yesterday, so I'm just going to repeat that one. Right, so we learned the formula, this one here, for distributions. Um, right, this is more variation. I'm just going to give you one formula of the distributions. One formula of the distributions in a second. Right, so we need to know that to perform a series of the distributions, we learn the following formula. We learn the following formula. Just one second, I'm going to actually write it down. Okay, because there are variations. Okay, so um, the distributions, either you're distributing um, R, so if you distribute R identical objects. Okay, because there are a couple of formulas to learn. Into we distribute our identical objects into n different boxes. Okay. What is the formula? Okay, that's the statement. So we distribute our identical objects into n different boxes. So it is n choose r plus n minus one r. And so this can be written like, okay, can be written as R plus N minus one factorial, R factorial, and then N, uh, um, N minus one factorial. Okay, so you can write it like that. You can leave it like the other one. Okay, so this has to do with identical objects. And then I'm gonna look at um, distinct objects. Okay, if you distribute the distinct, objects the distinct objects what is the formula okay now this is the case we get so we have r r1 r2 rn Distributions. Okay, we shall speak about the, the the if you distribute distinct or different objects. But now we are looking at the distribution of um, objects that 
become more identical. So, um, right, so then you distribute the, how many objects are there all together? Okay, so if you put, take the Fs and you fix them, you fix them so, you are left with how many objects? Okay, this one is like one, so it's one, two, three, four. Right. Now how many objects are not F? So you'd have one, two, three, four, five. Okay, this is what we do. Okay, then distribute. Um, the remaining Okay, there will be four non-Fs. In the three boxes. Okay, if you are to look at the three boxes. In how many ways? Right, so because now you are dealing with the three boxes, Okay. We are looking at the three boxes. Okay, you pause to think about actually what is being said here. Okay, we have made available three boxes because of the restrictions. So this is a box and a, a box and another box. Okay, so into n different boxes, this is can be written as you can write it as p plus o minus one four here. Okay. So obviously we're dealing with r identical objects if we have um, look at how many identical objects are there in the three boxes. And so we realize the fold that we shall be dealing with um, three boxes. And we can always look at these as um, involving, as we said, we actually distribute the remaining none four non-Fs, four non-Fs. In the three boxes. Okay, because obviously we said the three Ls are next to each other. The vowels E, I, and U are actually in alphabetical order. So if you have the vowels E, I, and U are actually in, in alphabetical order. So we have one, two, three, four positions. So the four non Fs in the three boxes are put that way. We've counted a total of five, but you can see that these ones here are in alphabetical order, and therefore it suggests that they are already organized, giving us four non-Fs. Meaning that we shall be dealing with F. Right, so normally these are in alphabetical order. Right. 
we can organize them in the form a string. Okay. That is clear. Um, okay, I want to say something else. So this will be organized like this, and therefore it's going to become six four, six choose four. Six factorial, six minus four factorial, four factorial. And the result is only 15. Okay, I can use a calculator to do that. It's not a problem. And if indeed your answer is six, choose four, or six combination four. So now this is actually, this is going to give us exactly 15 patterns. Right, next we calculate the number of the ordering of the non-Fs um, in their five positions. Okay. Determining. the ordering of the non-Fs in the five positions. in the five positions. Okay. Okay, the positions of this would be one, two, the objects are themselves one, two, three, four, five. Then have in the five positions. Of the arrows are just one symbol. You can look at it as one symbol. We note therefore that this one, this triple L is just like what? Like one simple, so L, L, L can sit in any of the positions, in, in any of the five positions. So this one can be placed. Uh, hello? Yes, please. Can you explain uh, where you got this from? Oh, this one. <laughs> okay. So obviously in this case, we are speaking of distributions and uh, now uh, it's exactly coming from this formula where we say distribute all identical objects into n different boxes. So here we actually, because the, the condition is that we have no consecutive Fs. So if the Fs are not to be consecutive, there are only two Fs in the weightful field. And therefore, but we need to make sure we separate them and put symbols in between before and after so that they are non-consecutive. So that gives us uh, three boxes. Okay, so obviously in this, in this formula here, uh, you actually will therefore be dealing with n of uh, the n of sense for the number of the boxes. Right. And there are three of them. So we'll just put the n here for three. And then now, how many are the um, identical objects or are the objects we actually are putting into the boxes? Right. We've already said that the objects that will be put there would be four objects. All right, we agree that we're counting one, two, three, four, five non-Fs, but this is the triple L is one, but now we then have what? We then have uh, that the vowels, uh, just we can regard them as one symbol. So the U, the, the E and the I are one. So it's one, two, these are vowels, right? So it's one, two, so obviously if you count one, you count one for the vowels, right? So, and now if the vowels are there and this one therefore is two, um, right, so you have three and therefore ultimately you have four non Fs in the three boxes. How many non-Fs will therefore be there? There will be actually a total of four non-Fs. Okay, let's look at that carefully. Let's say already you look at the non-Fs. What are non-Fs? Are the vowels, the Ls, the R, the E, and the D? Because these vowels are in alphabetical order once again, so E, I, and U will be 
organized in alphabetical order, giving a pattern and a string. Um, so those ones, you can regard them as, as a symbol. Right, so if you do, that gives us the distribution. Um, then we distribute the remaining four non-Fs in the three boxes. Right, in the three boxes. Okay, obviously, we're looking at the entire word fulfilled here. Um, and the Fs would be separated and giving us a total of three boxes. And with the grouping of the three L's, the vowels, etc., we have a total of um, four non-Fs in the word fulfilled. Okay, you can always look at how that, you can organize that and think of that very clearly and make sure that these are, so you have the Fs are out, you want to arrange them so that the Fs are non-consecutive, non so how many non-Fs are there? Um, you'd have the U, the vowel, the I is a vowel, and also the E is a vowel. Cross, cross, cross. So crossing them meaning they're just one thing. Um, right, so now you then have the arrows. Right, so the arrows are also one symbol. Right, so you think of that very carefully. Um, right, so try to think of that. Try to think of that. Okay, we'll look at that up carefully, but I want to mention a couple of things. I was then saying the, the non else in the five positions, if you count one, two, three, four, five. So the non else can be placed in the five positions. So if there are five positions for the non else, um, in the, um, uh, hello, the, yes, please. Uh, I'm confused uh, about how you got four non Fs. Okay. Because you think it must be three. Yes. It, shouldn't it be? <laughs> right. Okay. I'll get back to that in a minute. That's fine. I'll get back to that in a minute. Okay. I'll get back to that in a minute. Right, but now um, let me first say determining the ordering of the non Fs in the five positions. So obviously you'll have five positions, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, I'll get back to that. Then we have the LLL can therefore be actually placed in five ways. In five ways. Why five ways? Because five positions of the non Fs. Five ways. I'll get back to that observation. Five ways. Okay, just one sec. Right. Um. After that, you'd have placed the triple L in five ways. Then we have the letter D. Um, then the letter B can be placed in how many ways? Okay, obviously now we have placed the arrows um, and therefore we have four positions left. So the D can be placed in four ways because we have four positions left. Out of the five, the, the triple L have taken one position. And therefore, you have um, the D can be placed in four ways. Moreover, 
the vowels. Over the vowels, Okay, um, the vowels are A, E, O, U. Right, so in particular, the vowels E, I, U. Obviously, they are to be placed in alphabetical order. So they must be placed in alphabetical order. Okay, I'll get back to your observation, please. Right, alphabetical order. Right. Right, so obviously they must be placed in alphabetical order. in the remaining three places. Okay, because you had four places, now we have remaining three places, you have placed the D, so you have the remaining, in the remaining um, three places. In the remaining three places. In how many ways? Right, so, they can be placed in the remaining three places in one way. Okay, think about that. In one way. because they must be in alphabetical order. Right, so hence, I'll go back and read back, right. Um, hence the total number. Of Arrangements Right, the top number of arrangements is equal to Right, we have got we got fifteen fifteen ways here. Okay, I'm gonna cross check and see if there's something to rectify. And then for the non airs we had five positions and five ways. And then we had the four ways. And that would give us 300 ways for all the arrangements. Okay. Okay, I want to come back to this. I want to state the condition before we relook at you uh, at the observation you made. It's a brilliant observation. But I want to first speak about identical objects and the properties that um, encompass this. Right, there's a statement we learn, and the statement says the process of distributing. Okay, there's some detail here, and I want us to look at this statement carefully. The process of distributing of distributing are identical objects. Into in different boxes. Different boxes is equivalent to choosing a 
in ordered, um, the choosing in unordered subset of R box names. Like I'm just giving the rule we use for these um, quite in some about four, uh, three uh, to four lines. Okay. Right. The process of distributing R identical objects into N different boxes. It's equivalent to choosing an unordered subset of R box names. Um, right. With repetition. With the repetition from among the end choices. of boxes. Okay, we say um, that they are R plus N minus one R, which we can write like that. No worries about that, which is the formula. R factorial in minus one factorial. Distributions, I want us to analyze this statement carefully. Distributions of the R identical objects. Okay. So we're saying the process of actually distributing are identical objects into n different boxes is equivalent to choosing an unordered subset of R box names with the repetition from among the n choices of boxes. Thus, there are R plus N minus 1 choose R, which are in the factorial quotient as given. Okay. Um, I want to give a description before we move on. I want to give a description before we certainly move on. Okay. I want to give a description before we certainly move on. Okay. Right. So, what is the meaning of this statement here before I go back and then move forward? I want us to pause and reason what this how this formula works and how this formula can be used. But also I want us to analyze the process of distributing R identical objects into N different boxes. Um, right, so, but I want to look at a typical example that is gonna highlight the case that's very important. Did I leave space here? Okay. Let me look at the green example very shortly, and then if I go go back and um, conclude our previous um, discussion. So I want to look at a brief example. That's that's a little bit different from what you look at. It says how many. How many ways are there to distribute twenty identical identical sticks 
of red liquor right liquor rice and the 15 identical 15 identical six Okay, this is quite an interesting example, but quite short and nice of black. Liquor rice. Among five children. Five. Okay, how many ways are there to... Um, are they to distribute 20 identical sticks of red liquor rice and 15 identical sticks of black liquor rice among five children? What is the answer to this in view of that formula? Right, so I want us to look at the answer together. What is the answer to this? Let's look at the solution to this. And then we shall go back and then move forward. To a different question. Right. I want us to say we're using a model here. So using the identical objects model. It's just a model we are using here. Objects model of distributions for distributions what do we do we see that the ways to distribute 20 identical sticks of red liquor rice among the five children can be seen as equal to the ways to select a collection of 20 names for the 20 identical sticks can be seen as equivalent to 20 names. These names can be seen as sort of destinations. From a set of five five different names different names with repetition. Okay, just a sec, we're analyzing the green case here. Thus, you know, how many ways can this be done? So if you use this formula R plus N minus one R, what is R, what is N becomes the next question. Right, so, we can see that obviously we're actually looking at the identical objects. So if we're looking at R, identical objects, so we have 20 identical sticks, and therefore this will be 20. Right, you can write it as 20 plus um, 5 minus 1. And this is okay. We shall analyze, we shall simplify these. We can use a calculator to simplify these. But we are really saying um we want to distribute this 20 um red 
15 black liquor rice among the five children. So we actually are therefore seeing that um, the identical objects are 20. And then um, the children themselves are five because we have five different names. For we have this. Okay, using calculator, this is 10, 10,626 ways. Okay, okay, you, you just think of that, but I want to mention this. Right, using the same reasoning, now we dealt with the 20, what about the 15? Now we deal with the 15 identical sticks of the black, uh, black rigorize. Um, so, moreover, so we have 15. Plus five minus one fifteen for the for the other color. The, 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 uh, because the 20 are red and then the black. Okay, for the 15 are black. And if you use a calculator here, you get 3876. Okay, we're looking at logical reasoning here. And that's the point of doing these examples. We're trying to make sense of the principles in a way that applies to all the problems uniformly. Right, so we are then saying the distributions of the red and black critical rise are become disjoint. The multiplication principle applies. And so because that is joint, we use the multiplication principle. And so number of ways to distribute the red and black, um, total number of ways. equals 10, 6, 6 by 3, 8, 7, 6. And the answer is, what, 1,186,377. One ways. Okay, so you pause to think about this. You pause to think about this. Okay, but this will be how we're gonna, we can look at the local rice example um, and the five children, um, the 20 sticks and the 15 sticks, 20 red and the, the 15 sticks of um, a different color. Um, Perhaps this is a much more very direct and very simple example, because we are effectively saying here, you are dealing with our identical objects and you are doing it in different boxes. So here you dealt with the, uh, with the 20 um, black uh, or red, 20 red liquor eyes. Um, and now the, the boxes can be perceived as the children. And now the recipients are children so you are like putting this liquorized into boxes and these boxes are names of the children or are the children themselves. Right, okay, we're going back to the example. Right, obviously we have discussed the solution, but I want to look at if there's anything we need to analyze and modify as you suggested. So we're gonna actually quickly just go through that. Right, we're looking at the arrangements of, I want to just press through and make sure that the reasoning is correct here. Uh, right, we're looking at the arrangements of the letters in the word um, fulfilled. Right, so we said how many arrangements of the letters in fulfilled have all the following properties simultaneously, no consecutive Fs. And that meant no, no consecutive Fs of the two um, letters 
um, F. So we decided to separate them and put boxes on either side. So we put like three boxes in which you can like slot in things. All right. So the question then is, how many objects will therefore be the identical objects here um, that we need to now, because now we're looking at the, we're using these model uh, on the other side, but how many objects do therefore perceive as identical? Okay, right. So we are removing the Fs out of the picture. And so we are dealing with We are dealing with the remaining objects, right? And you are saying, obviously, the vowels um, E, I, and U are in alphabetical order, right? So if they're in alphabetical order, they can be obviously ordered alphabetically. And we have analyzed that, and we shall go back, we shall proceed to analyze in whenever, wherever we wrote it in the story, in the solution. Right, the three L's are next to each other, so they form one symbol. So if they form one symbol, I looked at this uh, word and I put the first F and then I actually put U and then I grouped all the three L's and then there's another F and there is I, there is E and there is the letter D. All right. Now I want us to look at which objects are identical and which objects are must be put into the boxes because now in the boxes we put using that model, we put identical objects. So what are those objects that are identical? Right, so obviously at this point we have separated, uh, we went on to say um, the then um, distribute the remaining four non-Fs in the three boxes. So the question is how many non-Fs are there? Right, we counted um, the U the I and the E as one symbol. Right, and then now we look at the L's as another symbol. And then we looked at the D as one more symbol. Right, so the question therefore is, um, how many non-Fs are there? all together. How many non-Fs are they all together? Okay, so somebody counts U, U, I, and E as one thing because they must be together. They must be in alphabetical order. And obviously you have the L too. And we have the D three. And now they must be put in the three boxes. So that's fine. And then now we proceed to say, obviously, determining the ordering of the non-Fs in the five positions, we counted a total of five positions, one, two, three, four, five positions. Okay, we'll continue. I'm just analyzing this with you now so that um, um, we continue. Okay, we continue. Okay, I'm just uh, looking at this carefully <laughs> to make sure that everything is okay. So obviously we dealt with the five positions, one, two, three, four, five of the nine Fs. Right, so the L's are placed in the five in five ways. Uh, then the letter D can be placed in four ways because after you have placed the L's in the five positions, then you'd have four positions left, and then in the four positions left, you can place the D. Right. Moreover, the vowels E, R, and that must be placed. Must be placed in alphabetical order in the remaining three places. Okay. 
Okay, continue. All right, in the remaining three places. Okay, I'm with you now. Just need to make sure that everything is okay. In one way, that's fine. And hence, now the total number of arrangements is that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now we're just discussing the idea, this one, the statement. Um, then distribute the remaining four non-Fs. in the three boxes. And we realized that it would be a U. Okay, I'm trying to look at that carefully. It will be a U, it will be L, 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 and to be um, the U, I, E in, in order. But yeah, this must be placed in order. I'm not saying they're in order. You can just place them in order. And then we have the D. And then we're counting three. Um, none Fs. Right. Um, and that means that you need to change here. And so now we are dealing with a total of the. So now this is going to be three. Okay, need to obviously take these things. like this because now we are dealing with how many different boxes we're dealing with n equals three boxes but now we counted the three um, objects to regard as identical okay um right so you need to always be extra careful Need to be always be extra careful. Right. So this one is going to become five. Three. Five. And then this one is going to become what? Five minus three. And this one is going to become three. And this one is going to become Five by that. So this is five factorial, then you can simplify this. This is two divided by two factorial, three factorial. Right, so what is this? This is five by four, three factorial cancels. This is also two factorial. And therefore this is 10. So you come here and put 10. Okay, so is, is there an interesting observation you made? I mean, that's really logically acceptable. So the rest is fine. So you'd have that. And this would be 10 by 5, which is 50 by 4, 200. 200. Okay, yeah, that's correct. Okay, we'll continue. Right, so we look at question 9. Right, question nine is a very interesting one. So it comes all the time in the exam, but it's like all the time. Right, find a recurrence relation with initial conditions for the, right. So we're dealing with recurrence relations and now they're part of the exam. So, but this section is quite straightforward. So it's not a very difficult one, um, but you just need to know the methods uh, of how to deal with recurrence relations. Uh, would would we'll spend some time on the recurrence relations that are examinable. 
um, write their uh, weird story sums, weird problems that really emerge from this. But let's just look at um, the kinds of methods we can, we can use, like this problem. Um, okay, we continue. So now, find a recurrence relation with initial conditions for the number of n digit ternary strings. Ternary strings are those strings with 0, 1, and 2 without any occurrence of the substring 0, 1. <laughs> right, and the marks are 7. So you need to just get your, your reasoning in order. Yeah, you need to get your reasoning in order here. Okay, let's just do this one together right now. Right, how do you find the recurrence relation its initial conditions for the number of n digits um, when n is bigger or equal to one? Okay, of those tenary strings. Tenary strings have those three digits, um, zero, one, and two. Right, first things first, we start like we do wet problems if you're in metric it's in school at school we let a n be the number be the number of such n digit in our strings Okay, we continue. So this AN is the number of such digital strings is unknown because we need to find the, the, the recurrence relation for the number of those n digit um, um, tenor strings. So the unknown is um, the AN, A sub, sub N. Right, so then, Okay, let's look at this. If we were to say, then the number of n digit right, the number of n digit okay. You continue. Right, so then the number of n digits, binary strings. Binary strings. Okay, we continue. Binary strings with one okay let's look at this right so obviously in this case you are interested in finding the known am the recurrence relation right the number of the n digit ternary things with one okay is what right so Right, so it is actually a n minus one because we're looking at the n digit canary strings. But in the n digit canary strings, we are removing zero one. So it's minus one. Right. Uh, 
Okay, I need to write that one carefully. Can I write that one? Um, because it's important. Um, okay, continue. Okay, let me write that one in a bit in detail because I want this to be very clear. Uh, it's a concept that can be very potentially confusing. With one is a n minus one. Okay, so um, why this a n minus one? It is to let me just describe so that this is there. Um, since as such, a string. Can be completed can be completed with any with any n minus one digit. Canary string Canary string not containing not containing the substring um, substring. Um, not containing the substring zero one. Okay, so we are looking at the n digit canary strings, and we are removing the substring zero one. If we are removing the substring zero one then we shall say then the number of the n digit canary strings with one is a n minus one we're removing a string okay moreover we say this okay because this is exactly the method of reasoning Moreover, um, the number of such integers, integers, binary strings. Starting with starting with two right, so is also okay, the number of the tenary string starting with two is also what? So we remove one. The number one so is also is also a n minus one. Okay, so we actually are looking at the n digitary strings starting with two is also. A n minus one. Okay, there's also a statement here because we have state those 
those strings that begin with zero, how do we deal with strings that begin with zero? Because um, the ternary uh, strings contain zeros, ones, and twos. Right, so those that begin with zero, let's give a statement that's a bit more clearer here. Right, but if the integer string it starts with zero. It can only can only be completed with in n minus one digit string. Okay, let's look at this. Um, Right, but if the n digit string starts with zero, yeah, um, I'm saying we're looking at those that start with zero and the significance of those. It, may, it can actually be completed with n minus one digit string. So if you have a string that starts with, with a zero, you can complete that one with the n minus one digit string because you can put, as you said, with an n minus one digit string and then it's gonna become n minus one, with the zero, so you'll have, you'll get an n digit string because you have n digits, and then you have zero. You have n minus one digits and zero. So n minus one digits and zero will give you an n digit string. Okay, nothing strange there. Okay, but we state therefore that. Um, which does not. Normally, there's a question like this that comes in this exam. Which does not begin with one. Which does not begin with one. Obviously, we are looking at a string that starts with zero. So surely it can be completed with, so you can put an n minus one digit string, which does not begin with one. Why must the string not begin with one? Because if then you're gonna have the zero one, but you don't want the zero one. So um, if you start with zero, then the n minus one digit string cannot begin with one because you're going to have zero one. So we avoid that. What is the number of such strings? The number of such strings. Um, the number of such. right of such things is right so the number of such strings is a n minus one minus a n minus two Okay, we're gonna analyze all these to make you understand the, 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 the sentences here and the claims that are made in this. But hence, what is then a n? Where a n is the number of such integer binary strings. For a n can therefore be seen as follows. It can be seen as twice 
an minus one plus an minus one minus an minus two an three an minus one minus an minus two n greater equal to three. Okay, I want us to analyze this together and make sure that every statement, every sentence is clear with A1 equals three. And And A2, if this one is the number of such n digit strings, right, so A1 is three, and what is A2? What is A2? Okay, we analyze this together, but we argue that A2 is gonna be three by three, three by three, minus one, but three by three is three squared so that you get eight. And this gives, these two give the initial conditions, but let's analyze these together and make sure this is very clear. Um, right, we recap on the claim, but first the question. Right, remember that we had to find a recurrence relation with initial conditions. So these are the initial conditions A1 and A2. For the n digit, where n is greater or equal to one, ternary strings, once again, that contains zero, one, and two, those are ternary without any occurrence of, we just remove the string zero, one. This question is there most of the times, and I have a strong feeling it is there even this time around. It can be exactly like this, or there can just be a modification of the string that is being um, removed, but very likely it's gonna be exactly like this. We can remove one, two string. So how do you analyze this question? So to analyze this, we say, we take, we let a n to be the number of such n digit binary strings. So is the number of the strings, n digit. Right, then we proceed to say, then the number of the n digit binary strings with one. Right, because we are looking at the zero one condition. So now we're looking at the number of the NTG binary strings with one is actually a n minus one. Why is it a n minus one? Since such a string cannot or can be completed with any n minus one digit binary string not containing the substring zero one. Yes, because we're not supposed to have the zero one. Right next. Um, moreover, we note that the number of such n digit binary strings that start with two that start with two is also a n minus one. Okay, so we proceed from that. But if the n digit binary string starts with zero, it can only be completed with the n minus one digit um, string, which does not begin with one. The number of such strings is a n minus one. Okay, so obviously you can see that we have a n minus one for the number of the entity binary strings with one. So it is an, 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 um, an A sub N minus one. And uh, also the the entity binary strings with two, right, are also A N minus one.
Right. And moreover, so we have a n minus one and n minus one. So the one and the two. And then now we look at those that start with zero. They can be completed like that. Okay, so you have a n for the zero. The strings for those strings that begin with zero. So you you'll have the a n minus one. Right, because you said that, but if the n digit string start with zero, it can be completed with n minus one digit, uh, with an n minus one digit string, which does not begin with one. So, because you start with zero, then you, you can't start the other string with one. So, um, you can complete it with an n minus one digit string, and hence the n minus one. Right, the number of such strings is then what? Right, so the number of such strings, therefore, is a n minus one minus a n minus two. Right, so you actually, therefore, are looking at those that begin with zero and you subtract the n minus two. You subtract the n minus two. So the understanding is that in those strings that begin with zero, you remove this substring in those that begin with zero. You remove this substring. And this substring obviously is a two digit string. It's a two digit string, so you subtract that, the n minus two. And therefore, this is what you get. So this is two. Why is this two? It is two because of the the end. Hello. Yes, please. Uh, can you explain this this part? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm trying to explain that part. So obviously we understand therefore that um if you let n be the number of such n digit binary strings, so it's the number of all the strings, um the n. So the number of all the strings is formed by the possible combinations of the strings. But the first string is that we look at is the n minus one string. n minus one is the number of the n digit ternary strings with one. Right? So the number of the ternary strings with one is a n minus one. Right. And then now we have those the number two, the number of ternary strings with two is n minus one. So there's n minus one for the strings that have one, and there are those strings that have two. Um, by one, we mean the strings that start with two and the strings that start with one. Um, so there's gonna be a n minus one for the strings that start with one, some strings will start with two, so there's a n minus one for those. So there, there's n minus one plus n minus one. Now we are dealing, this one, this case here is for the case of those strings that start with zero. Right, so the strings that start with zero, we note that they can be completed in with n minus one digit strings, which do not begin with one. Okay, but now we must remove, in the strings that start with zero, you must remove the two digit strings, this substring, so you subtract a n minus two. Why is this two here? Because it's two for those strings that start with one, the strings that start with two, and then this case here is for the strings that start with zero, but you just remove from a string, the strings that start with zero, you remove the zero one string. Okay. I want to add this one here. 
So we're saying, therefore, the number of n digit string strings which start with one. Okay, if it starts with one, we can complete it with um, an n n minus one um, digit string. Okay. But now there are those strings that start with one, those that start with two, because either the string starts with one or two or zero, because we're dealing with ternary. Um, so, yeah. So, um, Okay, continue. Okay, continue. Um, okay, either a string starts with zero or one or two. So we started with, uh, if they start with one, they can be completed with an n, mi n minus one digit binary string. All right, so if that is the case, so you would have therefore, because the an is the number of such n digit ternary strings, so you therefore have, because if it starts with one, then the string you'd have an minus one be the number of the n, um, n minus one digit ternary string. So you start with one. So in other words, this is a accounting principle. So if you start with one, then you are dealing with n minus one um, symbols. And then here, the next one start with two. You start with two, so for it to be n digits, an n digit string, you must, you could complete it with n, n minus one digits. Um, or an n minus one digit string. Okay. Now, um, so the, this a n minus one, there are two of them. So the string start with one and the string start with two, you'd have to just extend because why do you extend? You put the rest of the digits so that you have a, an n digit string. This one is the number of the n such n digit binary. You are doing the n digit binary strings. Sorry, if you're having one, how many digits do you add to make sure you have n digits? You must add n minus one, n minus one. So this one is for start with those strings that start with one. Uh, those that start with two, and this one is for those that start with zero. So there are two cases for those that start with zero, like we've said here. Um, right, but if an integer string starts with zero, it can be completed with an n minus one digit. If it starts with zero, um, how many? Because it must be, it must have n digits. So, how many digits then do you add? You add a n minus one. Which we, we should not begin with one, right? After the since they do not begin with one, but also you subtract from this the number of such entity ternary strings. Um, you subtract those strings that have zero one substring, and you get that. So the zero case brings about this difference. Those strings are start with zero. And yeah, this is those that start with one, two. And then you add this up. But obviously adding this up now, um, then the end can only begin from three or upwards. Why? Right, because then you're gonna have, um, because you have n minus two, and then you can start from a one. Right, A1 obviously would be because if AN is the number of such n digit ternary strings, so A1 would be the number of such one digit ternary strings. How many one digit ternary strings? Because AN is the number of such n digit ternary strings. How many one digit ternary strings? 
one digit can either be so this one, this one, or that one. So there are three of them: zero, one, and two. So they are one digit strings. So there are three of them. What about A2? Two digit strings. Right, or the number of such two digit tenaries uh, strings. The two digit tenary strings, so you can count those. So you pair this up. But now you must just subtract the zero one. If you pair this up, there are one, two, three. There are two digits. So the two digits, there are a couple of ways to do that. So you can look at the two digits uh, for this. So you have three choices for the first one. After you have, in how many ways can this be ordered? Three choices for the first one, for the first digit, because you are looking, you are dealing with two digits, so um, you are um, dealing with two digits. Three choices for the first digit, because you're dealing with two digit numbers, like one, two, two, two digit sequences. And then here, uh, now after you have, these three choices for the first digit, and then after that, you have three choices for the second digit. But obviously, you can do repetitions here. Okay, you can do because you can have this the string two, two is allowed because it's only a string zero one, so you must subtract one. And this therefore becomes eight, so it's three squared, which is eight. So, yeah, so this is the answer to your question. Okay, try to understand this. Okay. Next, next question. Okay, let's solve some recurrence relations like this one. Okay, normally you must be able to solve some of them like these. Let's solve this one um, for five marks. Normally solving this is not difficult. It's pretty easy, but there's just a couple of rules that you need to use. You, we, we use the alpha method. Right, using the alpha method, I've made space available. Yeah, it's not difficult, this one. So what you do is you use the alpha method. What is the alpha method? You let. Let a n be equal to alpha n. That's the method you use. Alpha superscript n. Then, Then the characteristic equation equation is then the characteristic equation is okay. We come to the recurrence. So if we have a n equals seven, a n minus one minus six, a n minus two. So we will have alpha to the n equals seven, alpha to the n minus one, because if a n is this, then a n minus one is just alpha to the n minus one. And then this one is six, a n minus two is gonna be alpha to the n minus two. Okay, now this one, you multiply by alpha squared, both sides, because you have alpha to the negative two. So if you multiply the left by alpha squared and multiply the right by alpha squared. So alpha to the n plus two, alpha to the n plus one, minus six alpha to the power n. Okay, do it like this. Okay, after this, remember this alpha, we just assume that this alpha is not zero. Because even a zero, it's the, a zero is two here. So um, this means you have, you have alpha squared 
minus 7 alpha minus 6 equals 0. We can simplify by eliminating alpha to the power n from this equation. And therefore, after eliminated alpha to the power n, you get this. Okay, this one is clearly a quadratic equation. So you have alpha, alpha. Okay, this one is pretty easy because it's you have the homogeneous in the non-homogeneous. So, okay, let's just finish this one. Um, let me see what you're getting here. Okay, what are the factors of these? So you have minus six, minus one. Alpha six or alpha one. Okay. Let me just uh, try to do it here. I can do it on the next slide. But there's an advantage of doing it on the same slide because you can we can see everything here. Okay. Um, Let's solve this together. So this thing here can be solved. There's something called the general solution of this. Then, um, then the general solution. The general solution is uh, just put the roots. So it's going to be a n is equal to. So you take an arbitrary letter a. You ra you, you take six. You raise you raise to power n. B is the next one. Alpha to the n. Mm. A is two, A is that. Okay. What is A zero? It's two the initial conditions, they will help us to find the the A and the B. Okay, let's find A0. What is A0 if you make N0 in, into this? So it's going to be exactly A plus B. Okay, you replace N to 6 to the power 0 is going to be 1. And then this is 2. It gives us an equation. Call it equation 1. And then now the other initial condition is that A1 is 7. Um, right, so if n is 1 here, it's going to be 6 to the power 1, which is 6a. b is 7. Right, you subtract these two things. Two uh, hello? Yes, please. I'm not sure if this part is right. Which part? Oh, that part. Okay, let's check that part, please. Let's check it together. Okay, um, because we got this one and we're just eliminating the negative, the minus two. So I just took a decision to multiply it by alpha squared. Yeah. Uh, okay, there's a plus. There's a plus. Part. there's a plus, maybe. Okay, there's a sign issue. Um. Okay. Okay, let's look at that part. Um. Because there's a plus six here. That's all. Because the six was transposing, became it was negative, it became positive. The seven became it was positive, it became negative, right? Um, is that all? I agree with you. So the six was negative and then yeah, became that one the problem. Please come again. It was supposed to be plus. Yes. Yeah, the six was supposed to be plus because it moved, it closed the equal sign, right? Okay, let me analyze that with you. 
Let me analyze that with you. Just one sec. Right, so the six was negative and became plus. Good. But obviously when you're here, you would have alpha to the power n, alpha to the power two, minus seven, alpha to the power n, alpha to the power one, minus six, alpha to the power n equals zero. Okay, we'll just separate these things to transpose the seven, and, and okay, this one became plus. Okay, because it was negative, it became plus. And then we factor out alpha to the power n. Okay, this one is a squared. So alpha squared, seven alpha plus six. Okay, so this can be factorized like that. So you can factor out um, the alpha to the power n. Uh, basically, this would mean that alpha squared minus seven alpha plus six equals zero. If, if that sort of um, resolves why we have this quadratic, and then the factors are indeed that, and you have that. Okay, let me know if it's, if, if there's anything of interest there. All right, right. So from this, now we have the following. We have the um, two minus equation, two minus equation one, and then give it them by elimination. Uh, 6a minus um, a is 5a. 7 minus 2 is 5. Divide through by five, we get that A uses capital A. Okay, dividing through by five, we get that two, um, we get that A is um, exactly one. So, okay, okay, just made this one, just made this one um, small, but it must be capital. Okay, um, now the capital, this one, 6a. Okay, subtract so these ones, you get 5a. And it becomes that. Divide through by five, you get that a is one. Okay, if a is one, then you can use any of the equations to get b. Okay, like, let's use this one. If a is one here, which means b is one. Okay, so if this is true, then it means you can just plug in the a and the b into the general solution, this one, where that is a, uh, that, 6 to the power n, b, uh, 1 to the power n. So a and b are both 1. OK, so the general solution would be a n equals 6 to the power n plus 1. So this is the solution. Because we have to solve this recurrent solution, we solved it, and this becomes the solution. How do we know if this solution is correct? We can check by getting a zero, the initial conditions. So if n is zero, then six to the power zero is one. So a zero is six to the power zero, one, one plus one is two. All right, and if we, if we get this one when um, a n, when n is one, six plus one, seven. So a one is seven. So this is correct. Right, we continue, next question. I have a few question, few yes, questions. Please. Okay. Uh, for this type of question, do you always uh do this? Yes, always, always. We always uh, let a n be alpha to the power n. Always. Okay, but obviously this one is the homogeneous. This is the homogeneous recurrence relation. Um, I'm gonna look at another example that involves non-homogeneous. Right, so the non-homogeneous recurrence relation um, is a little bit different. And we shall look at an example that involves um, that one. Okay, um, and so we, there's a small difference in the way the non-homogeneous, what would the non-homogeneous mean? Okay, we call it an inhomogeneous. Right, so this one is homogeneous. So I'm gonna look at this and say, so there are two types. Okay, let me write in red. So you can just write two homogeneous and inhomogeneous. Okay, so normally the homogeneous is the easier one. Because the inhomogeneous has numbers that do not have the do not have 
um, and the negative can subtract the three over two. Right, so let's look at homogeneous. What does homogeneous mean? Right, so the homogeneous recurrence, uh, recurrence relation well, the recurrence relations is either homogeneous or it is um, what you call in homogeneous. Okay, so but this one is pretty generally easy. It's easy to correct marks. There's just no confusion. Um, right. Um, right. So the homogeneous case would be Um, of the form, this one here. Um, right, the, homo the, the, the homogeneous will be of the form An equals C1, An minus one plus C2, An minus two plus Cr, A n minus r. So this is called homogeneous. So it has a's up to the end. Like there's n minus one, then there's n minus two. The others are just not there. You could have a n minus three. Okay, but you know, it starts like that. Um, right. Now, what about the inhomogeneous? And now the inhomogeneous has its own slightly different method that we use. Right, so the inhomogeneous would be of the form an is equal to e a n minus one. But now is not only a n, so there can be something else. Some function of n. And uh, now obviously we shall uh, spend time on that on those because uh, the inhomogeneous can be a little bit tricky. Um, and now the homogeneous ones are easy to solve. But now to solve the inhomogeneous, you must make this one zero and first deal with the homogeneous case by using the substitution alpha n, and then you come, you include this. So we're going to look at cases like those. Cases like those. All right. So the, the inhomogeneous case, um, if you're given um, an example like this one, Um, right, so you can have this one, a n. Need to solve this. I can do. I can always, if time is going to allow, I'm going to do an example. Uh, this example exactly. Okay, it can be minus four n. Then okay, three plus by two to the power n. So you see, at this point now, it's not only that you have the a sub uh, n minus something. Now this one is minus four n plus three times two to the power n. So it is called inhomogeneous. Because of that, then we'd have to first deal with the homogeneous case. So what do we do? We first make this zero, uh, use our usual um, a, n, a sub n equals alpha um, to the power n, and then get the general solution like we have done. And after that, we um, get something called the pack particular solution for this extra term that makes it inhomogeneous. Okay, so we're going to look at um, examples like that. But yeah, let's look at the uh, next problem. Right, a very important concept is called the inclusion exclusion principle. So the principle of, uh, use the principle of inclusion exclusion to determine the number of arrangements of length n. Um, right, so n is at least three, three or more. Of the letters A, B, C, repetitions allowed, in which each letter occurs at least once. Right, so we are looking at the number of arrangements of the letters in which each letter occurs at least once. Eight marks. Right, you get this one, you already passed the exam. Okay, it's, it's a lot of marks, but there's a bit more work uh, there. So well, this one here uses um, a wide range of methods, but we start as follows. Using the inclusion exclusion principle, you let A 
17. Of arrangements. Um, of arrangements. Of length end. Of length n, arrangements of length n, call those A. With no small a. Let a be the set of arrangements of length n. With no a. For because now we are saying of the letters in which each letter occurs at least once. At least once. So you let B be the set of arrangements. of length and with no B. Let's see be the set of arrangements arrangements of length of length n with no c. Okay, we don't understand why we are removing the, uh, the we're saying no a, no b, no c in each of those um, arrangements. Or in principle, we want to um, determine the number of the arrangements. So the number of the arrangements, no A, no C. A, B, C. Like that. So we want to determine want to determine the those where in which each letter occurs at least once. Okay. So if one determine the number of the arrangements um in which you have the complement of A, the complement of B, the complement of C, which means it's a union complement. A union B union C complement. Okay, we can, we can analyze what this means. But what is the total number of the arrangements? Total number of arrangements. Right, there are three letters here. So it's three to the power n. Three by three by three by three by three. Because the first, if you have these three letters, the first letter can be chosen in three ways. If you are looking at a, an arrangement of length n. The second one you can choose. We have three choices, you have three choices. But now we need to do this until n. Um, so we have three to the power n ways of this.
Okay, next. Now, the number of the arrangements of the strings in A will surely be the number of the arrangements in B because we're just saying no A, no B, no C. And it's also going to be the number of those because in C we said the set of the arrangements um, of length n with no with no c no b so we're just removing a uh, b uh, c so um, it's just the same number so n number of the strings in a is the same as the number in b the number in c and you analyze what the numbers are right so if we say there's no a So if we say there's no A, then we're dealing with B and C. And the B and C can be organized in two to the power N ways. Okay, if there's no B, two, you are dealing with no B, then you're dealing with A and C. Right, in C, I said, let's C be the number, be the set here of arrangements of length N with no C. No C means you're dealing with A and B, there are two of them. Okay. Continue. Um, what about if we are to look at the number? A and B, set A, intersection B. How many combinations are these? Okay, so there are three sets A and B. So you can look at A intersection B, or you can look at A intersection C, the number of strings in A intersection C, or you can look at the strings in um, B intersection C. But there's no other, all the sets are taken care of here, but we'll look at all possible intersections of the three sets. For A means, A means there's no A. In B, there is no B. Then I left with C. In A and C, in A, there's no A. In C, there's no C. You're left with B. So it's one to the power n. Just one. Uh, by one, by one, by one, by one, uh, etc. So it's one to the power n of those intersections of those sets. Goodness me. You continue. And if you have now, The number of the, um, now if you intersect all of them, no A, no B, no C, you intersect all of them. What, what are you gonna get? Are you gonna get an empty set or what? Yes, because this one says no A, no B, no C. So it means they don't intersect these. The number of the elements in the intersection is gonna be zero. Okay, good news. So we continue by the inclusion by the inclusion exclusion principle. Okay, so you have A intersection B intersection C. Okay. Good, good, good. We continue. So this one complement of A, complement of B, complement of C. 
Okay, now this one has three sets. It has three, isn't three? Inclusion, exclusion, it involves three sets. Inclusion, exclusion, a principle that involves three sets. So the formula is that it is N for um, everything minus N A minus N B minus N C plus N A plus A B plus N B C okay so we have these N and A and B and C and A okay Okay, so you have this one in A, B, C. All right, so what is this? So you have complement of A, complement of B, the complement of the set C. Hey, goodness me. Three to the power N is this one, number of the arrangements, total number of the arrangements is three to the power n. And then now we we, we have done the, the a, n, n, b, n, c. A, n, a, n, b, n, c is two to the power n, but there are three of them, so you can look at three times two to the power n. Uh, n, a, intersection b, intersection c, b, intersection c. Okay, it's one to the power n. You can view that as just one. So if you add all of them, it's going to be three. And then this guy here is zero. So you have this. So this is the result. But now let's analyze this together. Because the point of this discussion is to familiarize ourselves with the concepts and how this principles are used. Um, we take questions that are common in the assessments and discuss them to make sure that we just understand what's happening. That's what this is about. And familiarize ourselves with the approaches that are standard. Um, the aim is not just maybe to solve one million questions that do not even appear in the exam, but it's to make sure that you understand the things that appear in the exam. Okay. If you use the principle of inclusion and exclusion, just passing through this one small, um, to determine the number of the arrangements of length n, n greater or equal to three. Okay, obviously n greater or equal to three because now we're dealing with three symbols and repetitions are allowed, in which each letter occurs at least once. Okay, so if each letter occurs at least once, the easiest way is, for example, if you look at the set A and we say, let A be the set of arrangements of length N with no A, what will the complement of A be? The complement of A because A has no A. Set A has no small A. So which means that the complement of A is going to have what? It's going to have A. So because now then the complement of A is going to have A because we're looking at the number of arrangements of length um, that in which each letter occurs at least once. So we decided to say, okay, let the A, B, and C be with no A, no B, no C. So that now if we deal with the, so we want, what we want to determine um, the complement of A intersection, complement of B intersection, complement of C. Why is this complement here? Because now we are saying at least once. So the complement, if A has no A, then the complement of A is going to have A. So 
So this one is A and this one is B and this one is C. But most importantly, it has at least one A, at least a B, at least one C. Okay. But now, if you look at the set theory according to De Morgan's law, um, the intersection here of A, a complement the section B complement the section that, we can take the union of these and take a, a, um, a common complement. Right, so this is in view of De Morgan. Right, uh, is in view of what you call De Morgan's law. Um, Right, just uh, I'm just gonna comment on Timogan and then we're done. Right, so right, so in view of Timogan, what does Timogan say? Well, Timogan says that if you take the complement of this, if you have A and B. You have this. And then if you have this one, which is this. So, okay, I'm doing it for two sets here, but yeah, even three sets. So now we have A intersection, then it's the same as this, but now you, the intersections become the union when you take a common um, complement. The total number of the arrangements for all this, in how many ways can you arrange the letters A, B, and C? The first letter, because now you are the arrangement of length N. Right, so where N is greater equal to three. So now um, the number of arrangements is gonna be how many letters are there? They are uh, three, so the first letter is gonna be chosen in three ways. The second letter is gonna be chosen in, in three ways because how is this possible? I need to make this as practical as possible. But we can have a letter of length n, a number of arrangement, an arrangement of length n. So that's going to be a, b, c, d, a, b, c, d, a, 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 whatever. But now it's a, it's of it's of length n. But in the end, now the first letter is must be chosen amongst these. So you can choose it in three ways. After that, the second letter can be chosen in three ways. The third letter can be in three ways. Okay, did I put a D? <laughs> I meant this is an A. Okay, so you can have something like that. So yeah, it's A, B, C like that. So you have this. So now three times three times three times three times three times three times three. So it's three to the power N, the length is N. Okay. I would say then seeing, so the number of the, arrange, of the arrangements will be three to the power N. Now, N A N B N C equals what? Um, um, okay, so the number of the elements in A intersection B, A intersection C, B intersection C is one to the power N. Okay. And N A intersection B intersection C equals this. Okay, by the inclusion exclusion principle. By the inclusion exclusion principle. Um the number of the elements in A intersection B intersection C is, uh, this is the formula for the three sets. Normally it's, uh, we deal with the three sets, but yeah, we can also deal with, um, two sets, two sets are easier. Okay, you've seen two sets even in school, but these are the three sets. Okay, let's deal with the three sets. Right, now the number of the arrangements, so all of them is three to the power n, the n, a, n, b, and c is two to the power n, but there are three of them, this one is uh, one, three, and this one is only three.
Okay, so this is the answer. Okay, we are done with this question. And this and that is the answer. Okay, I believe it's clear. We move to the next one. Okay, there are things we call generating functions. Okay, here's the question 11 on generating functions, 15 marks, total marks. Right, so obviously we're dealing with the distributions and uh, like uh, we mentioned the, the idea of distributions in one question, um, we're dealing with the world we feel something like that. Yeah, okay. Right, so generating functions to answer the following, determine the number of the 10th digit, 10 other sequences in which the digit two occurs at least once. And the digit zero occurs an even number of times. And the next question B, so yeah, I must have made uh, um, a provision for space there. Okay. Um, the generating functions, the formulas are there at the back of the uh, of the exam. So um, always they give you the formula for the generating functions. Um, the power series uh, are there at the back of the exam. Okay. Um, obviously, the power series are determined in other modules of mathematics, like your um, um, analysis, your real analysis module, and your numerical analysis. That is where we develop a lot of the power series. But obviously, we use them here. Um, we apply them to real life problems to determine the number of the 10 digits in the sequences in which the digit two occurs at least once, but is a 10 digit, 10, these are 10 digit 10 sequences, but in which the digit two occurs at least once and the digit zero occurs an even number of times. Okay, let's look at this. Sorry, how do, what is the answer to this? The digits. Right, that because we're dealing with the 10 other sequences, zero, one. It's not like binary, zero and one. Binary. So zero, one, two. The digits zero, one, two are distinct. Um, so we require we require an exponential generating function um right Okay, there are more exercises we're still supposed to do on uh, Hamilton paths and because there are tricky questions that really can come from that area. Um, the chromatic numbers, we need to play around with more questions in isomorphic graphs and non-isomorphic graphs. Um, and obviously, uh, yeah, we had to delve into a bit more um, in-depth questions on those particular areas, right? But the, these digits are distinct and you require an exponential generating function. Right. Determine the number of the 10 digital sequences in each digit two case at least once, and digit zero case an even number of times. Okay, this is easier with the generating functions, but it can also be done using the methods we, we used. We, we can use, like, uh, what method did you use earlier? Um, we, we had a similar question, very interesting. Okay, number of arrangements of those are, okay, we can use the inclusion exclusion. Right, so is this one? Is the one before? Is this one here? Find the recurrence relation for the number of these. So you can determine the, the recurrence relation for the number of these. Okay, so um, it's one of those. Because this recurrence relation, you can solve it. So the, the, kind of the question we're looking at now can be done using recurrence relations. But now we're going to use the generating functions to do it. But you can use the recurrence relations. And now at this point, you can solve because this one is homogeneous. So you can just say an is alpha to the power n. And then you can solve this. And you, you can get the, using the initial conditions, you can solve this. Okay. 
it's, it's okay. But now we're going to use generating functions uh, um, just for us to use something different and learn something different. So the digits, these are, di are distinct. Um, so we require an exponential generating function. In this case, the generating function The generating function is, okay, what is the generating function? Okay, so the generating function now is what? Okay, because you need to determine the, the number of the 10 digits, ternary sequences, in which the digit two occurs at least once, and the digit zero occurs an even number of times. Okay. Okay. I want us to analyze this together. Right, if the digit two occurs at least once, and the digit zero, an easy number of times, okay. So you have x, one of the generating functions. I'm going to discuss this. You have x squared over 2 factorial, x cubed over 3 factorial, plus dot, dot, dot. OK, this is one of the generating functions because the digit 2, 2 occurs at least once. Okay, I'm gonna discuss this in detail. I'm gonna elaborate on this. Um, all right, and the digit zero occurs an even number of times. So if the digit zero occurs an even number of times, it means that for the digit zero, you're gonna have one, and then it can okay, you can, it can be x squared, 2 factorial. Um, you can have x to the fourth power, 4 factorial. OK. Okay. We also have another generating function, x squared over 2 factorial. We shall discuss this. I'm going to elaborate on these generating functions and their significance in this kind of a problem. We have 3 factorial plus dot, dot, dot. Okay, let's pause to discuss a little bit briefly about the generating functions here and their significance in this case. Right, so what is the significance of the generating functions? Right, we discuss that one. Right, so the couple of things obviously that we need to learn here. Um, if we say, for example, if we say you need to determine the number of the 10 digit 10 other sequences, we are dealing with 10 digit 10 other sequences, and that is gonna the, the, the 10 is gonna appear in the um, you can see you will see the significance of the 10. Um, but I want us to discuss 
the fact that the digit two occurs at least at least once. Right, so if the digit two occurs at least once, right, so at least once, so it means that you start from one, the power of the generating function, the power of the x. So now the power of the x is gonna, because it's at least once, it's gonna be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, etc. So it can be those particular cases. It can be those particular cases. Right, so you note that. Right, so, but also now end, end means you multiply now because you said that digit two occurs at least once. So one, two, three, that. So they, they, you put times because there's end here. Right, so you continue and say the digit zero occurs an even number of times. The digit zero occurs an even number of times. So if the digit zero occurs an even number of times, it means that you have even numbers. What are the even numbers? They are zero, two, four, six, eight, and so on. So those are the even numbers. So that is why here you, you're going to have so this one is like x to the power zero. So you have x to the power zero x to the power two x to the power four x to the power six, and so on and so forth. Right. When the digit zero occurs an even number, that's why you have those. And now you have, um, also, Another generating function that is obtainable at the back of the at the back of the paper. So at this point, what is evident um, is that you need to include the generating function at the back. Okay, I'm gonna just give a comment about that one there. Right, right. So um, remember that we are dealing with the number of ternary sequences. What are the ternary sequences? For the ternary sequences contain because we're dealing with 10 digit sequences in which we have that. Okay, this is a very interesting problem. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay, I'll read you now. There's something I want to mention. Right. Okay, there's some there's certain things we call types. There's certain things we call types when we're dealing with the generating functions, and I want to mention that. The types of things. Um, Okay, the types of things. Okay, so this one takes care of what? This one takes care of two? Of the digit two. It was mentioned first. 
This one takes care of the digit zero. So this one takes care of the digit one. Because we're dealing with the ternary sequences and the ternary sequences would have zeros, ones, and twos. Right. All right. Okay, continue. So what does it mean? It means that the one, there are no restrictions on the one. So you take a general exponential generating function. This is an exponential generating function. Okay, let's multiply these things. So what is this thing here? Okay, this, is, this exponential is always e to the power x is one plus, this is the general one. So you have x squared over two factorial, then you have x cubed over, over three factorial. Okay, so, but now if you have just the x uh, and that, one plus x, x squared, et cetera. So now this one now, because it's, it's for the, Digit two, it starts from x, so you must you must move the one to the other side, so it becomes exponential x minus one. Okay, let's look at this one now. It's x squared over two x. Okay, this one is having even things. He's dealing with the even things. What does dealing with the even things mean? Right, dealing with the even things, if you look at the back, this one is e to the x plus e to the minus x over two. That is what is at the back of the paper. Then this one of one plus x, x squared in that is the general e to the power x is always like this. Okay, so we have this now. Um, we can just multiply everything. My goodness me. e to the power 3x minus e to the power 2x plus e to the x minus 1. So what is this? Okay, so this is actually one half. Okay. Okay, what is e to the power three x? E to the power three x is three to the power r. E to the power two x is two to the power r plus one because of the e to the power x. Okay, why is it like this? It is like this because you have x to the power r. Like in real analysis, you can just make this r, but now you need to understand what that means, and you have r factorial. So, which means that if it's e to the power three x, it means here, wherever there is x, you, if it's three x here, you put three, three, three. 
And then now these three X is going to become like that. Three to the power R. Then you have two to the power R plus that. So this is minus one half. We want and we want the coefficient. Oops. Right, one the coefficient? What? Okay. Okay. I'm glad I did not get this deleted when I was pressing one button and extended. Right, we want the coefficient of x to the power 10 over 10 factorial, which is, hey, then uh, use the recurrence relations we saw before and just uh, Test the understanding of the method, but yeah, we had to drill, need a bit more drilling on these questions because they can emerge a bit tricky sometimes. So it's three to the power 10 minus two to the 10 plus one, you divide by two. Oops. Like that. Okay. Okay, so this is the answer. We want the coefficient of x to the power 10 over 10 factorial. So the coefficient of x to the power 10 over 10 factorial, or it's going to be when r is 10 here. r is 10. When r is 10, it's going to be 3 to the power 10, 2 to the power 10 plus 1. Okay over, now you have the coefficient. Okay, sorry, it's gonna be x to the power 10 and then 10 factorial, but it's gonna be three to the 10, two to the 10, one over two. That is the coefficient, is the coefficient. And so that is the answer. So, we have got the answer like that. Right, so I think that we have discussed uh, these generating functions. All right, it is my plan that we have no practice uh, questions, so I'm always uh, thinking about what to do. So I'm thinking about the tomorrow's plan of crafting a plan that is gonna deepen um, our understanding about solving a wide range of questions on the things we discussed. Because this one was basically, question 11 was the last question. So tomorrow we're gonna, we're gonna start by doing part B because part B is also a little bit long, but um, we're using generating functions. Uh, most of these questions that can be done using generating functions can be done using recurrence relations, um, the an uh, equals an minus one and so on. Uh, right, so um, how do you learn this and how do you practice this? Uh, first things first, these are like examples. So we did these as examples. So examples, how are examples studied? Examples are practiced and, and uh, are, are practiced repetitively. So one repeats and make sure you understand these examples. You can make sort, of, sort of make sense of these examples because I'm planning to bring more questions tomorrow. Um, right, I'll give you more information about the sources of these questions and where actually these questions come from. Okay, because there is a question bank I'm going to mention where these questions come from. And I'm going to bring more questions. It's my plan to bring more questions from the actual bank of the questions so that you can practice like the kind of the question we saw, the question about 
um, fulfilled, and so on. Okay, but I must thank you for joining us today. I think that the time is about. We can take it. We can take a break. It's about sixteen hours. And I think we started about one p.m. Uh, Thirteen hours, that is approximately. There's a fifty, a few minutes after. Okay, thanks so much. Goodbye. No chatting now. <laughs>